Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, listen, like, like anything you build, you always have plans, don't you? Anytime you try to build anything, if you're building a house, if you're building a business, if you're building a facility, there's always going to be blueprints. How many know that God already has a blueprint for your life? God has already designed the blueprint for your life before the foundations of this earth was ever formed. Before God formed you in your mother's womb, God said, I have a blueprint for their life. Now the question is this, is will you ever allow God to give you the blueprint so that you can actually take the rubber band off the blueprint and set it on a table and open it up and then see what God wants you to accomplish while you're on this earth. Because you weren't born by accident. You were born with divine purpose. You're not an accident. God had, listen, maybe your parent may have told you, for some of you, <laughs> maybe your parents said, you were an accident. Well, guess what? It may have been an accident for them, but it wasn't for God. Aren't you glad? God had an intention for your purpose right here on this earth, right here at this hour. And so the next few weeks, I want to talk about what Nehemiah, everybody say Nehemiah. Nehemiah. We're going to be speaking about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a great wall builder. He was a great builder of not only walls and cities, but he was a great builder of people. And God wants to not only build us up, right? But he also wants us to build up others as well. And so this message isn't just for you to say, okay, God, just deal with me because we're already, we're by, by, by nature, by human nature, we're already like that. We're consumed with us all the time. And so we're trying to get ourselves a little bit, the attention a little bit off us and a little bit more on him. Therefore, we can reflect back him in us. And so this is the goal. Um, if I were to title uh, this message, something clever, I would probably call it the crying Nehemiah. And it's interesting because all of us have cried at some point. Like, for example, my two kids, when they first went off to preschool, okay, Alexis I did good with, my boy I didn't. And so when he went to preschool, I remember I took him and, and you know, they used to have to sit them in, in these row of lines and they would cross their, their, their legs and sit on the floor. And, and I remember, like, the teacher's like, okay, thanks, parents. Y'all can leave now. And I'm just, like, walking away. But I didn't leave. I was the only parent at the fence looking through the fence at my little boy. And my little boy was looking back and his eyes were welled up with tears because his dad left him. His dad forsook him. But then my, my eyes welled up too. I was, like, I, was like, I was like ready to teach him how to ditch on the first day of school and bring him back home. But then I was too scared because I don't know what my wife would say if I would have done that. Um, or maybe you've cried when your child went off to college. My wife cried for three months when my daughter Alexis went off to college. You know what? Now my son's he's next. But uh, we've all had moments in our life where we cried. Some of us are so... Uh, I'll, I'll just say it because I've been pathetic before where I've cried inside of a movie theater and the thing is fake it's not even real but you're just like <laughs> it's not even real it's just all make believe but it just does something to the strings of your heart where in your own perception you think it really happened we all cry for really goofy things can I get an amen yeah. it's so true but let me tell you something Nehemiah 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 was crying for the purpose and the heart of God. And I think it's so easy as a Christian, as a believer, as a human being, to get so cold in your heart, to get so cold in your love for people, to get so cold about, about people that are broken and hurting that we literally just walk past brokenness because we are too afraid to deal with pain. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah is someone that obviously was busy with work and he was, you know, he had a job. He had responsibilities. It wasn't like, like, like he didn't have anything to do and he got bored. And he's like, okay, let me do something for God. I have noticed in the Bible that God has always called people that were busy doing something. That'll preach real good right there. If they ain't doing nothing, you got to start doing something. God has never called anyone doing nothing. God has always called busy people doing something. Look at the Bible. Every single person was always busy doing something. Nehemiah was one of those men. He was busy working for a king. And so 
as, as I began to, to study the book of Nehemiah, I started realizing that, you know, this is a great parallel to our life. And I want you to understand this because um, if not careful, you're just going to think you're hearing a good message. And I'm not here to preach good messages. I'm here to, to challenge your thinking. I'm here to challenge your heart. I'm not here to tickle me, Elmo, your ears, okay? I want you to walk away from this place saying, dang, I got to get my life right. Because we all got to get our life right. Every single one of us. We need, to get it, we need to get it right. We need to get this whole thing called life together. Okay, there is no perfect life in this house, but we work out our salvation daily with fear and trembling, and I pray that we get the fear back of God in our life, that we don't just walk in here and check it off and then go back and have some lunch, and then we just keep living the same way, but that we walk out of this place saying, God, forgive me. God, I want, I want to please you. Like the only satisfaction I ever want in this life, the only way that God is ever going to get the glory of his life in you is when you're finally satisfied in him. that help two or three people that's all right that's okay i'm good with three i'm good with three i'm good with three that's okay okay great four so we can parallel this to our spiritual walk with god because i believe that there are people here that in your own personal life right now uh, there may be some some broken walls and what do i mean by that well you know nehemiah was someone that was working and taking care of his responsibilities and then some 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 men came to him and started speaking to him about Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem and how the walls were burnt down and how the gates, the entrance, the gates were broken. And they began to share with him the destruction that took place to Jerusalem and the temple. I want to explain something to you. The reason I, I say this parallels perfectly to our life today is because in those times, they had already built this amazing temple for God, a place called the house of God, a place of worship, kind of like Elevate Church. Many of you, you weren't here when we started. We started with 12 people here at Elevate Church seven years ago. And from there, people just kept coming. Lives kept being changed. People's lives are being transformed. Miracles are taking place. It's been amazing. It's been awesome. It's not been an easy journey, but it's been an awesome journey along the way. And so they built this temple where people would come from all different places to Jerusalem, and they would worship God. If you were to put a face value on the church facility, okay, that they built for God in those times, in today's market, it would have been worth a billion dollars. A billion B, billion. That's how much commitment, dedication, and sacrifice they had for the house of God. And so what happened was the enemy came and brought destruction. And so as we read the stories, I don't want you to just get a picture in your head of like, okay, so Nehemiah was just helping build some walls. He was just putting up some drywall. No, guys. Just think about our world today. Our world is so destructive right now. I mean, there are places. I, I've been to, to Israel, and I remember when I was in Israel, I, I was so, like, determined that I said, I'm going to go to Syria. And, and I kept telling my guide, I'm going to go to Syria. I'm going to go to Syria. And I was so close to Syria. And, um, and when I was there, they're like, no, you know, Mauricio. That's when ISIS was just starting to just kind of start the whole brewing of ISIS. And that's when they really took over that place. And, uh, and I had this passion because I'm like, God, they need, they need the gospel. And, and, the, and the, the guy said, you know what, even if we tried, man, they're not going to let us in. It's going to be difficult. We'll probably, you'll probably end up being a martyr. It, it, it won't be good. And so anyways, I was a little disappointed. But one day, one day Middle East is coming for me. Um, and, uh, and so I left disappointed because I understood. I'm like, you know what, there are, when we talk famine, in, in, in this Western world, we don't, we don't even get the big picture of what famine looks like. When we say famine, we're like, okay, you know what, we're eating beans and cheese burritos. Like, that's my famine, you know. Or I'm eating cup of noodles right now, praise God. Uh, their famine is you got little kids with pop bellies 
that are starving. We're talking about children laying on the streets. We're talking about children's parents who were martyred. We're talking about mothers that have been weeping and sorrowing and mourning for, for days, if not years, because they have nothing left. This, they're just trying to figure out how are they going to survive? How are they going to feed? How are they going to nurture their children? You're talking about grown men like you and I just sitting there, and we have no work. We have nothing to provide. Can you imagine what that feels like as a man, not having the the ability to provide for your family and you're responsible and you're seeing your children go to bed without food, not one day, not two days, but sometimes for a week or weeks and we're just sitting there trying to figure this out. I want to paint the picture in your head because this is what our world looks like today, but nobody wants to talk about it. We have a different Babylon today. It just looks a little bit different, but the same struggle The same pain exists in our world today. And so Nehemiah is sitting here doing his thing, right? He's doing his job. He's doing his responsibility. And Nehemiah was well aware that for 70 years, the people tried. Everybody say 70. Very important to remember. For 70 years, the people tried building or rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and, and with no effect, could build nothing. Every time they tried to build something, the enemy would come and take it from them. Every time they would progress like five steps, they would take 20 back. Have you ever felt that way as a Christian? Come on, you come to God, you have a special moment with God, and then all of a sudden life comes, and then you know what? You went from being so, so passionate about this love for Christ, this love for people, but then someone did you wrong, someone harmed you, someone hurt you, it put a sour taste in your spirit, in your soul, and then now you're just drifting away off from God? You become like that prodigal son or that prodigal daughter? You're just gone, you're just like, you, you're lost so, so Nehemiah was well aware of this. And so what didn't touch him 70 years prior is now touching him now. And I pray in the name of Jesus, what maybe hasn't touched you for a year or five years or 10 years will finally speak to you now. Because there's a season for every person under the sun. And I pray the season is now. Because you can't say I'm ready to spring forward with you, God, and not think that God's not going to require sacrifice and obedience. Amen? And so um, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Are you guys ready? Let's do this thing. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1. And I want you to understand something, okay? Because some of you may be like, well, thank God I'm not called to ministry. Praise God. (laughs) I'm glad he's the pastor and I'm not. Praise Jesus. Guess what? Nehemiah, um, he was not a contractor. He, He was not an engineer. He was not a carpenter. Nehemiah had no construction experience. And I think so many of us that are believers, if not careful, you think just because I go to church, I read my Bible and pray, I'm good. No, you're not. God calls us all priests that know him. We are an extension of what God wants to do on the earth. Every single one of us. So think about it. If Nehemiah did not have the, the, the skill set to build walls, but he had the will set. See, God's just looking for willing people. Not necessarily people with ability, But God's looking for people with availability. (laughs) Where you say, and be careful when you pray, God, use me. Oh, 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 you'll get used all right. Oh, oh, you're going to be a tool in somebody's hand. Oh, yeah. Oh, it it comes with it. And so I just want to be very clear as we're going through these next few weeks. Nehemiah, he he wasn't a contractor. He wasn't a construction guy. He wasn't in the gym. So this guy has never built walls. Maybe you've never prayed for someone. Guess what? You can do it. Maybe you've never helped someone through, through, through pain and mourning. Well, guess what? There's always a first time for everybody. Always. So I'm going to break the whole fear mindset of I'm not called to ministry. Yes, you are. Everybody say this to me. I am, I am. A, wall a wall builder. And it ain't the kind of walls you're thinking of. 
because I know what kind of wall builders most of our, us are. You know, we, we build walls with relationships. We build walls with people. God's saying that's not the walls we're talking about. We want to we wanna rebuild broken walls. And they parallel our salvation as well, right? If you think about walls in the Bible and Psalms, he calls the walls salvation and strength. Do you understand that the, that, that the, the temple was in Jerusalem? The temple to me reflects, um, it reflects you and me. We're the temple. God says, you live in a temple, so I'm the temple. You know what the walls are? Your soul. And your soul is what's getting broken many times. It's your mind, your will, your emotions, right? Isn't that where we hurt? Isn't that where the pain comes in? So guess what? So this does parallel to us. God's saying, I want to rebuild your soul so that you, the temple, can be whole. It's going to be good stuff. So I'm going to get all up in your grill in the next few weeks, okay? So just stay with me. All right, Nehemiah 1, for, for real now. Let's do it. So let's start in verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11, so just stay with me here. Um, also, I encourage you, for the next few weeks, start reading the book of Nehemiah. That's your homework. Every single day, I want you to read Nehemiah, because as I'm preaching, it's all going to connect, okay? So read the book of Nehemiah. I already started. I'm already way ahead, uh, but I want you to get into the book of Nehemiah. We're going to learn a lot of stuff on, uh, on how to live this Nehemiah life. Verse 1, it says, these are the words of Nehemiah. He was the son of, and I'm going to torture some names here, but that's okay. I, my name gets tortured all the time, especially at Starbucks. Uh, Hakaliah, I was in the fort of Susa. I was there in the 20th year of, uh, as, you know, the king. What is it? Thank you, Adazerzes. We have a student here. Thank you so much. Just, you just think you're all that, aren't, don't you, right now? Yeah, yeah was the king. <laughs> it was in the month of Kislev. At that time, Hanani came from Judah with some men. Now watch this. And he was one of my brothers. I asked him the other men about the Jews who were left alive in Judah. So we now know that there's destruction. So it's not that Nehemiah didn't know any information about this. He was well aware of it. Just like right now, you're well aware of someone specifically, whether it's someone in your family, whether it's someone that you work with, whether it's someone in your community. You know what they're going through. You're well aware of it, but you've done nothing. Nothing. You just keep walking by. But there comes a day where all of a sudden, man, the Spirit of God, as you develop your spiritual walk with Him, things that didn't matter to you before, all of a sudden, now they, start, they begin to matter. And so here you have Nehemiah, he starts asking, hey, tell me about those Jews that, that are still alive. How are they doing? So can, can you imagine the conversation? They're probably talking about everything I shared with you, you know, the starvation, the, the war-torn city, etc. And it says, uh, not only did he ask about the men, but he also said um, they had returned from Babylon. I also asked about Jerusalem. And he and all the men with him said to me, some of the people who return are still alive. They are back in the land of Judah, but they are having a hard time. They're having a what? Hard time. Have you ever been in a hard time? Huh? We've all been in a place of a hard time. He says, so they're all alive, but they're having a hard time. And he says, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard about these things... I sat down and wept. It's amazing how he never wept until this moment where it finally brought conviction. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you wept for someone? I'm not talking about a funeral. I'm talking about people that are alive. He didn't weep over death. He wept over those who were alive and who had a hard time. He wept, and he says, and he didn't eat for days. And he says his, his countenance was sad. So just think about this, but check this out. It's okay to be in a season of, of weeping and, and mourning and, and, and crying and all that stuff, but there's also a season where you gotta get up and you gotta do something. And look what it says. And so when I heard about these things, I sat down and I wept for several days. I was sad and I didn't even eat any food. And I, and I prayed to the God of what? Heaven. Huh? 
You see, so many times the reason we don't do anything is because we want to do it in our own strength, not realizing that we need to start praying to God and then God will give us the wisdom to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And I prayed. Everybody say, I prayed. prayed. Say it again. I prayed. prayed. Close your eyes. Say it. I prayed. prayed. Say it. I will pray, God. Okay, look. And so he prayed to the God of heaven. He said, Lord, you are the God of heaven. You are a great, wonderful God. You keep the covenant you made with those who love you and obey your commandments. You show them your love. Please pay careful attention to my prayer. See how your people are suffering. Please listen to me. I'm praying to you day and night. I'm praying for the people of Israel. We Israelites have committed sins against you, all of us. Admit it. And I and my family have also sinned against you. Do you know the first thing? The first thing to rebuild your life is to admit that you have sinned. Notice he didn't say, God, I've seen what the enemy has done to them. No, he said, God, we realize that all this brokenness, we realize that why our world is dysfunctional, why our world is so lost is because we've sinned against you. While everyone else is trying to figure out brand new laws, we need to get back to the real issue. The real issue is that we continually keep sinning. And we keep burning the walls without even realizing that, my God, we're not taking any personal responsibility for what's taking place. And so here you have this man, Nehemiah. Listen, he didn't even live there. He's well taken care of, but he has such a burden for the people. He is so broken. He says, God, forgive them and forgive me. Forgive me. The Bible says if my people would humble themselves and pray, I would heal them. You know what? Maybe you just, you're just one repentance away from your breakthrough. Maybe you're just one repentance away from getting that victory in your life that you have not been able to break because it's been a stronghold. And he says, and I and my family also sinned against you. We've done some very evil things. Let me see all my evil people. Just wave your hand. Don't do it. (laughs) I saw a hand back there about to go. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We haven't obeyed the commands, rules, laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember what you told him? You said, if you you people are not faithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, check this out, there's the answer. But if you what? Return to me. If you do what? Return to me. If you what? Return to me. I'll get you back. I'll heal you. I'll restore you. I'll get you strong again. Huh? He says, If you obey my commands, I will gather you together again. I will bring you back from the farthest places on earth. I will bring you to the special place where I have chosen to put my name. Do you all remember the first time you gave your life to Christ? Remember how special that was? Do you remember the moment that you would pray and you just, boom, you just felt the presence of God? Remember when you used to just, remember when you would all come to church on time for worship? (laughs) Y'all remember that day? Remember? And it was special. Notice he puts the word special. When you, know, when, when, you, when you yourself hear yourself say this about you or hear others say, I just, I don't feel that connection with God anymore. What they're saying is, I just don't feel that specialness of God anymore. And listen, it's not that God ever removes his specialness. It's that we remove ourselves from special. Because you can have special every single time you walk into his house. And so he says, remember that special place. Verse 10, Lord, they are your people. They serve you. You used your great strength and might, mighty hand to set them free from Egypt. Lord, please pay careful attention to my prayer. Listen to the prayers of all of us. We take delight in bringing honor to your name Give me success. Look at that. It's, it's about getting you right first. You see, because unless, unless you know how to lead yourself, you'll never lead anyone. You got to lead you right before you can lead anyone else right. And so he's starting to deal with him. He's like, man, God, help me to get my life right. Man, me and my family, let me get right first. Father, help us rebuild us up again. God, forgive us so that you can rebuild us back up again to what we used to be and put your name on us and give me success today when I bring my request to the king and I was the king's wine taster. Let me see all my winos in the house. I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, 
Do you know what? He even says what he did for a living. In the original translation, it's called cupbearer. A cupbearer was responsible to be the CIA for the king or for the president of today. The CIA person, what, takes a bullet for the president. Well, guess what? The person who was the cupbearer or the wine taster was the one who took the first sip from the king's cup before the king would try to be poisoned. And so if the cupbearer dropped dead, well, then he did his job. So here you have, <laughs> just, just saying, yeah. praise God. And so here you have Nehemiah. He's like, man, I'm just the cupbearer. I'm just doing, I'm doing my thing. But listen, he went from doing his thing, he went from thingdom to kingdom immediately. Like, uh, what, what is it? What, what's, what's happening here? Something ticked him off. It, it just, it, it rubbed him the wrong way. You see, God will give you a vision, guys. God will give you a purpose. And many of you, you've seen things that God has shown you maybe years ago, and you have yet to see it come to fruition. You see, before we started Elevate Church, God said, Mauricio, you're going to open a school. You're going to build a school. I just never thought it would be internationally. I just never thought that. And so for years, we're talking years, for years, nothing was happening until the day that I stepped foot in Oaxaca, Mexico, and I was walking there. God allowed me to see. See, I've been to Mexico plenty of times. And I've seen the poverty, and I've seen the pain, and I've seen the destructiveness, and I've seen everything you can possibly think of. It's, it's, it's my, my family root. I've seen it. But there comes a day when, you, when you're finally ready, hopefully that happens before your time, that you finally get a revelation that, man, what am I going to leave on this earth that's going to say I obeyed God? What? How much more are you going to keep serving your purposes and never serve any purpose of God under this sun? When? When? And so as I'm walking through there, God said, Mauricio, build me a school. I've never built a school before. I'm not an educational, you know, anything. Heck, man, I went to six high schools, right? I'm just trying to figure this whole thing out. But self-taught, hungry, who taught me? The Holy Spirit. Who's renewed my mind? God. God. When you come into the authority and the obedience of God, God will expand your intelligence. He'll expand it. I meet with business owners that are millionaires, and they come to me for counsel. Why? They're like, where did you go? Bro, I just, I love God. How does, how do you, how do you, how do you know this? The Holy Spirit equips me. The Holy Spirit equips you. Do you understand that God has equipped you with every spiritual gift needed here on this earth? So we have no excuse. When you stand before God, you can't say, well, God, I'm so sorry. I just didn't have what it took. God's going to be like, no, I gave you everything it took. You just didn't have the will. You didn't have the will. Why didn't I have the will? Because you didn't have the want. Why didn't I have the want? Because you didn't have the desire for me. You see, until you finally come to that place of saying, God, search my heart. Search me deep. Until you pray, search the depths of my heart, you will never seek the depths of the Father. You'll never seek the depths of his plan for your life. You'll only cruise through life, and you're building your house, your bank account, your kids, all great stuff. But where's Jesus in the mix of all this? Where's the Nehemiah in you? Are you getting this today? Okay, let's keep talking. I only have a few more minutes. Can I just keep going just a few more minutes? So listen, verse, 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 chapter 2, verse 11. Let's skip over. Look what happens now. So Nehemiah finds favor with the king. Uh, He's got a good reputation with the king. The king says to him, why are you so sad, Nehemiah? Why aren't you eating carne asada? This is your favorite meal. What is happening with you? We cooked this for you today. Why? And he's like, man, I'm broken. I'm broken, king. Why are you broken? Well, man, I had my brother came and told me about Jerusalem and the walls are broken. And and, uh, I I just can't. I'm sorry, king. I just, it's difficult for me just to know all this information now. And now I feel what God feels for these people. And the king says, okay, what do you want to do? He says, well, I want to go. I want to go see. 
And the king said, here. And he gave him a whole bunch of letters of validation saying, if anybody even thinks twice to stop you, you show them my validation. You show them my ring stamp. And you let them know that I have approved you. I'm the one that has sent you and you're going to be good. And whatever you need, I'll provide it for you. How about, huh? Come on. What if more employees were good employees that you're, even your employers, like, what do you need me to do for you? That's a whole other sermon. But we'll get there one day. It would be a good sermon. Nehemiah 2 verse 11 says, I went to Jerusalem and I stayed there for three days. Then at night, everybody say at night. Because at night is when, the, is when the darkest hour of pain always reveals itself. I took a few other people with me to check out the walls. I hadn't told anyone what God wanted me to do for Jerusalem. So here's what happens. He shows up on the scene. He sees the walls. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God begins to speak to him. The Spirit of God begins to reveal some things to him. And it was in the secret place, obviously, because this man prayed. God will never reveal anything to you that's worthy or worth it in public. God will meet. He'll give it to you privately. When you're on your knees praying, seeking his face, then he'll give you the master plan. Huh? That's how he does it. So there's two things he did. Number one, write this down. He prayed. The first thing he did was he prayed. He prayed about the situation. What are you facing right now? What are you going through? What, 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 what challenge, what, what, what brokenness do you have that you have yet to pray about? Look at what Philippians 4, 6, 7 says. It says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and requests to God. Then because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you what? Think and the way you what? Feel. You see, Nehemiah was a little, he he, he was a little too emotional. He knew how to deal with it. So he had to pray. You know, he got a little cray-cray, got a little just, who knows, maybe he was sobbing, yelling. He had to pray because only the Spirit of God can control him again. And so he prays. And then what does he do? Then he inspected what was taking place. He inspected. He started saying, okay, I see the brokenness. I can see what's happening here. I see that the people are hurting. Oh, my God. See, it went from information to revelation. It, so many of us, we just keep hearing, hearing, hearing. God says, but I want to reveal some things to you. I, I, I don't want you just to be the church who hears. I want you to be the church who does. We got too many hearers in the church, every church. They come, they hear, and they hear, and they hear, but nothing. They do nothing. I pray this doesn't condemn you, but that it convicts you to do something. Build something for God. Get involved. Get connected. Do something. There's already a vision here. If this is your house, then let's, let's build God's house. But look what happens here. He inspects the walls that were destroyed. And so a few points I want to give you today as, as we close is that the person that God uses first starts with a burden for his people. You have to come to the place where you have to have a burden for people. In other words, if you want to fix a problem that either you have or someone else has, has, then you have to know what is the problem first. What's the problem? What is the issue? That's why this whole thing with, with what's happening in our country, it gets me so upset when Christians are just so goofy on social media, like the whole gun thing. It's dumb. It's so stupid that everybody gets caught up on this tangent of laws. Laws are not going to heal. Laws don't heal. Yes, they can fix things. I get it. But here's the problem. The reason that we, the church, okay, the reason that we, the church, don't have a burden for his people is because we have more burden on politics than we do those that are mourning. You see, until you learn how to mourn with people that are broken and hurting, you will never, ever, never, ever help anyone change or heal. We have to first learn how to mourn, not get on social media. Oh, yeah, if they only had this love. How about let's just mourn for a minute? Can we? Can we just mourn for a minute? Can we just all just get together and cry for a minute? Be like, God, save us. Forgive us of our sin. Not getting on social media, putting in your little two cents. Seriously. I'm talking to people in my church too. Tell me how that changed anybody's life. 
Tell me how many people came to Jesus when you're just going ahead being so politically incorrect. And we don't know how to mourn with people. The reason Christians don't help people is because they're afraid because they don't know how to mourn with people. Most people tell me, Pastor, my, my, my family member just died and I have to go see their, their, their spouse or their, or their child. How do I deal with it? It's a, it's a fear. You see, because we're too quick to judge instead of being quick to mourn. I always tell people, you know, you know how to mourn? You go tell that person, I love you. Whatever you need, I'm right here for you. You grab them by the neck and you just grab them like that and say, I got you. Whatever you need. You don't need a Bible verse. You don't need to come with some stupid, ignorant, you know, thing of like, well, this is why I think it happened. No, let me just love you. Get up here, Junior. Get up here. And just love him. Just like, man, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I've known this kid since he was little, so I can do this. Right, Junior? Yeah. Exactly. You just say, man, it's going to be good. Man, God's going to get us through this. It's going to be all right. You know what? You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to have the answer. His name is Jesus. And then he does the rest. Thank you. We have to remember, guys, that God needs a Nehemiah spirit back in the church. We're builders. You guys worn out yet? Okay, good. Jesus starts dealing with this. Hey, y'all remember that whole thing of dumb ask question? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked a dumb ask question. Want to hear another story about a dumb ask? For those of you that are new, dumb ask. In other words, what that means is sometimes you ask a question that you already know the answer to. That's called a dumb ask question. And so there was a dude that wanted to sound so intelligent and smart, he asked a dumb ask question. Sometimes people just ask dumb ask questions because they want to hear themselves. They just want to sound intelligent. They want to sound like they're smarter than everybody in the room. And so right here, Jesus starts talking about this issue of why, why Christians, okay? Mind you, he's talking about believers. Why we the church don't be the church. Look at this. Luke 10, 27, 37. I'm almost done. And Jesus answered. He said, love the Lord your God. He brings them back to the, the first thing. He says, listen, the first thing, you need to learn how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. With all your strength. You love God with everything that's inside of you. You will never start the healing process or the rebuilding process until you love God with all your heart. That is step number one. Until you fall in love with Jesus, nothing will change. Why? Jesus is the answer. He is the source. He is the tool that God used to save you. He's the only one that can adjust you. God bless you. He's the only one that can heal you. He's the only one that can restore you. He's the only one that can redeem you. He's the only one that can change you. His name is Jesus. And so Jesus says, so number one, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Love him with all your strength, with all your mind. And, and love your neighbor as your self. And so he says, hey, love me, love people. Love me, love people. What's happened to the church of America is that we love sermons, but we don't love God. We love messages. We love podcasts. We love Instagram. We love Facebook. We love everything but God. I'm talking to us. Stay with me, okay? Don't get offended. It's going to get gooder. And he says, check this, says, he says, and you have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do that and you will live. Now watch this. But the man wanted to make himself look good and asked a dumb ass question. <laughs> dumb ask, dumb ask, dumb ask, okay, dumb. Y'all don't get weird on me, okay? You've all asked them too, so have I. You already know, like, should I give? Should I serve? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and robbers attacked him. Where was he going? Jerusalem. Where was he going? Jerusalem. So check it. He brings it back to Nehemiah from Jericho. 
They stripped off his clothes. They beat him. Then they went away, leaving him almost dead. A priest, a Christian, an Elevate Church member walked by and happened to be going down that same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. <laughs> didn't see that. <laughs> we didn't see that. I didn't see that. I didn't. There's that movie, Eyes Wide Open, Eyes Wide Shut for the church. That's what Jesus is saying. When he saw the man, he passed on the other side, and then a Levite also came. So uh, we're talking about a priest, uh, someone that followed Christ. A Levite had religion, but not, not God. And then it says, then the Levite also came by, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So this is basically, he's telling you a story of someone that was solid with God, and then someone that was kind of lost with God, but knew God. And then he brings the wicked person. The Samaritans were the ones that had no God. And it says, but a Samaritan came to the place where the man was, and when he saw the man, he felt sorry for him. You see, that's why people stay away from churches by the droves, because they say, man, the world is nicer than the church. The church, is, the church is mean. The world is nice. So Jesus is using this guy as an example, a Samaritan, a wicked guy. He walks by, and the guy feels sorry for him, and he went to him, and he poured out olive oil and wine on his wounds, and he bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Then the next day, he took out two silver coins. He gave them to the owner of the inn. Take care of him, he said. When I return, I will pay you back for any extra expense you may have. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was at, attacked by the robbers? And the authority on the law replied the one who felt sorry for him Jesus told him now go and do the same it's amazing how sometimes once again the reason that we don't like to we don't like to face pain is because we don't know how to deal with it so we rather go the other side because we don't feel qualified God will qualify the unqualified when you're willing to do whatever it takes to be the person God wants you to be for someone. God says, love me and love people. Love me, serve me, and serve people. That's where God's bringing us back. So basically, what God did for him is he basically said, hey, listen, he said, Nehemiah, the first thing is, if he were to talk to us today, Nehemiah would be like, you got to have a burden for people. Number two, he said, you know what, and then God gives you a vision for his purpose. In other words, without a vision, God sent to them. He let him look at everything. He says, listen, Mauricio, he says, elevate church. Listen, if you don't have a vision, the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. You see, vision is what keeps you grounded from ever going back where you came from. When you have no vision, you go back. You go back to alcohol. You go back to the addictions. You go back to pornography. You go back. When you have no vision, for when you don't have a divine purpose from God, you'll always sway. It'll happen. And the third thing Nehemiah would say to you and I, he would say, now learn how to be committed to that purpose. Stay committed. Stay faithful. Stay faithful to God. Bless you. I love this. In verse 17, I said to them, you can see the trouble we're in. He took responsibility. Jerusalem has been destroyed, he said. He said, fire has burned up its gates. Come on, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Then people won't be ashamed anymore. I also told them how my gracious God was helping me. And I told them what the king had said to me. And they replied, let's start rebuilding. Say that with me. Let's start rebuilding. Now say it like you mean it. Ready? One, two, three. Let's start rebuilding. Say it louder. Let's start rebuilding. Look at the person next to you and tell them. Yeah. Let's start rebuilding. Let's start rebuilding. Let's start rebuilding. So they began the good work. In the next few weeks, we are going to begin the good work in your life and others. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.